Hey lore lovers, my name is Eric with the Lorebrarians YouTube channel and welcome to part 2 of The World of the Witcher Explained. If you haven't already, be sure to check out part 1 in which we explored the setting of The Witcher, the continent, the geography, and the geopolitical landscape. I'll leave a link in the description below. In part 2, we'll be taking a closer look at the natural, unnatural, and supernatural as we discuss the magic and monsters of The Witcher. As with all the videos in this series, this is meant to act as a cursory guide for those new to or returning to The Witcher, laying the foundation for future videos to delve into more specific topics and details that deserve to be discussed at length. But before we begin, if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, or if The Witcher is dear to you, consider subscribing to the channel where lore videos are uploaded frequently. The support is much appreciated. Alright, time to gather our cloaks fasten our swords and prepare our protective elixirs as we trek into the dangerous wilds of the continent and seek out the mysteries of magic and monsters. Let's dive in. Magic is replete in the world of The Witcher and acts as a fundamental source of power used both by the natural and unnatural. It can be found coursing through bubbling creeks and winding rivers. It can be found deep within the rocks of the earth, within the very air. But despite its prevalence, magic and the ability to wield it are not innate characteristics of the world. Rather, they are alien powers brought here hundreds of years ago in a realm-wide event of cataclysmic proportions. The Conjunction of the Spheres The Conjunction is not a well-recorded or understood event, as it took place roughly 1,500 years ago, and scant recordings have survived through the ages. What we do know is that it brought new things and wrought disaster upon the world. It is thought by many scholars, priests, and sorcerers that the multiverse consists of many different realms, or spheres, separated from another by time and space, and drifting listlessly through the ethereal substance between. Like ships sailing on the water, these realms carry about, sliding past one another as they follow their paths. But when paths intersect, the ships are charted for a collision course, and so when realms come crashing together, their realities merge, and for a short time, they are no longer discrete, separate entities. Some inhabitants get tossed overboard, others find themselves on a new ship entirely. The conjunction of the spheres was a cataclysmic event that saw many, if not all spheres, realms, and dimensions intersect in a disastrous collision. The conjunction allowed many things to enter the world, including the first humans. But more importantly, it brought the energy source, soon to be called magic, permeating into the world and suffusing it with its properties. And the world has been different ever since. But what exactly is magic? Magic, sometimes referred to as the power, the force, or chaos, is a mystical energy that is wielded by mages, druids, witchers, and other humanoids, as well as magically inclined creatures, to cast spells, fuel weapons of war, conduct research, heal, and hex. In order to use magic, one must first channel its power. There are some individuals born with an unusually strong connection to magic and have the ability to unlock devastating magical potential. They are known as sources, and their abilities often manifest in dangerous erratic ways that if not educated properly, lead to madness and death. Notable sources include Princess Cirilla of Sintra and her mother Pavetta. It's true that sorcerers or magic wielders can use magic alone, but it comes at the expense of their own vitality, and so they rely on channeling magic from the world around them. To channel, one needs the talent for magic and then only two things, concentrated will and focus. But of course, proper channeling takes years of study and practice. Uncontrolled channeling is often damaging and even fatal. There are four elements from which mages channel. There are water, earth, air, and fire. These natural elements correspond to elemental planes and thus have large reserves of magical potential. Each element has a specific type of magic associated with it. Water is among the first elements new sorcerers use to channel, as it is both abundant and relatively stable. Often hydromancy is used as a means of divination and reading fates from water. Air is an easy source to draw upon for channeling, but it's difficult to control due to its aggressive dynamics. Air is used by soothsayers, and druids or mages call on it to control weather. Earth is the most accessible of the elements, one just need look down at their own feet. 
Additionally, it has huge potential for power, but due to its static and stubborn nature, it requires a great deal more effort to channel, and so most sorcerers do not call upon it. Those that do can create destructive seismic activity and create golems of stone to wage war. Fire is the most dangerous of the elements to channel due to its fickle nature and unpredictability. It often provides its power too swiftly, which can kill the unsuspecting mage. Sorcerers that have learned deep focus and concentration can call upon fire to devastating effect. So now that a mage has successfully channeled the power, what happens next? The accumulated mystical power is transferred into something more tangible, colloquially known as casting a spell. There are but two ingredients absolutely necessary for casting a spell, concentration and an adequate amount of accumulated power. Of course, many wielders of magic rely on incantations and gesticulations to make the act of spellcasting easier, but it isn't vital. The power required to cast a spell is proportional to its strength and complexity. This fact often troubles less experienced sorcerers that use excessive amounts of power to cast mundane spells. Spells take myriad shapes and functions. Many are used for divination, others for moving objects in nature, and yet others for creating something from nothing. The extent to which magic may be applied is limited only by the ingenuity and creativity of its caster. There are two subsets of magic that have been deemed forbidden due to their dangerous or unethical potential. They are Goetia and Necromancy. Goetia involves the summoning of demons or demonic entities from other planes and dimensions in hopes of controlling them for the summoner's purposes. It's quite easy to perform, but demons are powerful creatures, and only an equally powerful mage would be able to control or contain them. Sadly, most summoners are quickly pulverized. Necromancy can be used to raise the dead, or as a means of divination to seek answers from the recently departed. The knowledge of necromancy is not forbidden, its practice, however, is deemed unethical. Signs are small spells and cantrips frequently used by witchers for a few reasons. Firstly, to use a sign requires only concentration and a small gesture. The user doesn't even need to possess the talent for magic. They merely need not be anti-talent. Secondly, these spells are quick to cast, making them particularly effective during combat without slowing a witcher down and often surprise their adversaries. There are many useful signs for witchers such as Ard, a kinetic wave that can knock down opponents, and Igni, which sends forth hot waves of flame. Magic has a long and interwoven history with civilizations, kingdoms, and society at large, one rich enough to warrant a full-length video exploring this history. Briefly, most human sorcerers and sorceresses belong to the Brotherhood of Sorcerers, an organization of mages founded centuries ago. They can frequently be found in the high courts of many kingdoms, acting as advisors to the ruling class and steering their realms toward continued progress. Some courts, however, see the Brotherhood of Sorcerers as a secretive, manipulating body and distrust any mage that tries to intervene in their kingdom's affairs. A large portion of sorcerers act as mage journeymen, traveling from settlement to settlement, seeking out locals who need their services. Traditionally, the Brotherhood teaches new mages from two different schools. Female adepts are trained in the art at the Academy of Eratusa on the Thanet Islands. Male adepts, conversely, are schooled at the Institution of Banard in Cadwin. There is a long-standing belief that the sorceresses of Eratusa receive a higher quality education and are better trained than their male counterparts. Magic was not the only thing that arrived on the earth with a conjunction of the spheres. Vile creatures from planes steeped in darkness, hulking monstrosities with the power to destroy entire villages, beings with an appetite for the creatures of the earth, especially humans. These are the monsters of the Witcher. Many of the monsters of today are post-conjunction beings brought to the earth by that long ago and cataclysmic event. They're not native to the realm and as such didn't develop into the hierarchy of nature. They come from a myriad of realms and are themselves vastly different from another in most respects, yet there are some shared characteristics between the majority of monster races. They are seen as abominations by the natural beings of the earth. These monsters don't fit any ecological role or niche, 
and many can be likened to an invasive species. Most monsters have a predilection for hunting or indiscriminate killing, and most all have an aversion or weakness to silver. It's true that some creatures native to the world can be called monsters, like the werebub and vran, and so I must qualify that when I say monster I'm referring to the post-conjunction species that encroach on the natural order. All throughout the continent, monsters can be found lurking in dark forests, hiding beneath murky waters, or soaring over the clouds. Their presence in danger to humans is what initially spawned the school of witchers. Creatures called necrophages subsist mainly on carrion and corpses, although they do eat fresh meat as well. Necrophages include the abhorrent and disgusting ghouls, foglets and rot fiends, as well as drowners which use their skill in water to catch unsuspecting prey. It's thought that due to their similarities, all necrophages came from the same realm. Then there exist creatures created by magic, sustained by it, or possessing magical abilities. They include but aren't limited to the accursed beings such as Striga, Botchlings, and Wraiths. The dangerous, shape-shifting bloodsuckers collectively referred to as vampires. The winged hybrid species like the griffin and cockatrice. The enigmatic, intelligent, shape-shifting being of the forest, known as the Leshen, And the majestic, awe-inspiring races of dragons that soar across the vast mountain ranges of the north. The monsters of the Witcher are diverse in appearance and habitat. They frequently hunt weaker, unsuspecting prey, desecrate graveyards, and stalk moonlit highway roads. They make the world all the more dangerous for its inhabitants, but at the same time, all the more interesting as scholars seek to understand their ways. Were it not for the conjunction of the spheres, the entire history of the world would look much different than it does in the current age. Thanks for watching this video on the magic that comprises the Witcher world and the monsters that can be found within. Leave a thumbs up if you liked the video and be sure to subscribe for more lore content. And now I want to hear from you. Let me know which monsters curdle your blood and what form of sorcery is your favorite, as well as suggestions for future videos in the comments below. Huge shout out to Alex Joaquin, pianist, composer, and longtime friend for the intro and outro music. I've linked the references used for this video in the description below. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore.